We are in week four of uh, our series on Volunteer Revolution, and this is called to belong. Uh, you and I are called to belong and not just believe. Genesis chapter 2, verse 18, uh, we were reminded early on in the book of beginnings that even in a perfect and sinless environment like the Garden of Eden before the fall of man, uh, that God said in Genesis 2 and 18, it's not good for man to be alone. We were created for community, we were fashioned for fellowship, we were formed for family, and none of us can fulfill the purposes by ourselves. The Bible knows nothing of spiritual lone rangers, solitary saints, uh, spiritual hermits, isolated from other believers, deprived in some way of fellowship. It never talks about those. It never celebrates those. Everybody that the Bible talks about and celebrates through uh, the pages of Scripture, uh, it is talking about those who are enjoined to family, those who belong to family and those who are in community. And that's how God chose to work and chose to bring us together. It was Him that said it wasn't good for us to be alone. And so He's brought us together and put us together in community. Now the Bible talks about uh, community and it, and, it, and it uses some language that I want to give to you that we're going to touch on uh, throughout the Scriptures in 1 Corinthians 12, 12, Ephesians 2, 21 and 22, 3 and 6, 4 and 16, Colossians 2 and 19, 1 Thessalonians 4 and 17. This is the kind of language that it uses. Listen, we are put together, we are joined together, we are built together, we are members together, we are heirs together, we are fitted together, we are held together, and we are caught up together. Look at your neighbor and say, Pastor's going to talk about together. <laughs> you are not on your own anymore. As soon as you joined family and you became a part of the family of God, you are no longer alone. Now write this down if you're taking notes this morning. God formed me for His family. God formed me for His family. We know that because Ephesians chapter 1, verse 5 says, God decided in advance to adopt us into His own family by bringing us to Himself through Jesus Christ. This is what He wanted to do, and it gave Him great pleasure. You were formed for family. The other thing I want you to write down in your notes is God's family is called the church. God's family is called the church. We know that because 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 15 and 16 says, I am writing these things to you now, that even then even if I delayed, you will know how to live in the family of God. That family is the church of the living God, the support and foundation of the truth. I and you are called to belong. The family of God is the church. Now, as we think through this, it certainly makes logical sense because God decided to make Jesus the head of the church. He didn't make him the arm or the foot of the church or the hand of the church, but he made him the head of the church so that all of us could be together as the body. We could all uh, function and, and, and move in the direction that the head leads and guides and directs us. And Jesus is the brains of our operation, right? So three understandings that you and I need to have with respect to what we're going to talk about today. Number one is God formed you for family. God formed you for family. Number two is God's family is the church. And number three is God wants you to belong to the family. If God went to the trouble to make Jesus the head of the family, then certainly he wants you to be a part of that. Wouldn't you think so? Now, why is it important for us to have this understanding? A couple of passages of scriptures I want to share with you. Ephesians chapter 2, 19. So now you are no longer visitors or strangers. Now you are citizens together with God's holy people. You belong to God's family. And then Romans 1 and 6 says, You are among those who have been called to belong to Jesus Christ. Now that word, uh, church in the Bible is from the word ecclesia, and it means called out. So it's fitting that it fits right with what we're being talked about, how we have been called, uh, and what our purposes are. 
And, and we are called out as, as a church. The church is not something that you go to. The church is, is not a location or a beautiful building. The church is, uh, is, is not anything maybe that you and I have thought of it at various times in our lives. The church is made up of those called out ones that belong to God. The church is the family of God. It's the, it's the body of Christ. So you can have church and not have a building. You can have church and not have a location. You can have the church that is, is, is worldwide and, and uh, not have many of the things that you and I might attribute with uh, necessarily being the church. We can all get together and, and uh, you know, down at the river and have church, can't we? Because the church is the the family of God, the body of Christ. Now, there are five benefits of belonging and getting connected that I think are crucial. I could give you a lot of them, but these are the five basic categories of crucial understandings about belongings, benefits of belonging and being connected to the family of God. Number one is, in God's family, I learn my true identity. In God's family, I learned my true identity. Now, most of us identify, you know, with various kinds of relationships. We come to understand that our identity comes a lot of times out of our relationships, out of family. And, and so we have come through life identifying ourselves in particular kinds of ways. But the most important identifier for those of us who have accepted Christ as our Savior, made Him the Lord and the leader of our life, is that we are members of the family of God. Ephesians 2 and 19, you are members of God's very own family, citizens of God's country. You belong to God's household with every other Christian. We talked about that just a moment ago. Now, why is it that it is so important for us to understand and belong to the family of God? We have so many identifiers in, in life that we could, we could call ourselves by, um, you know, and, and identify ourselves by, by our race, by our, you know, or the class that we, we come from, by the, the location. We're proud as to be in Texas, aren't we? I mean, you know, one of the things about moving back here, I was reminded how proud Texans are. You know, there's a star on every house and, uh, and a Texas flag waving, you know. We have a, a sense of pride about that. And these are identifiers for us. But why is it so important that we understand we're in, uh, and, and belong to the family of God? Here it is. This is the only part of your identity that's going to live beyond this life. It's it. At the end of days, you're not going to be known as an American. You're not going to be known as a Republican or a Democrat. You're not going to be known as an Asian American, a Native American. Uh, you're not going to be known by any of the identifiers that we may have clapped, uh, grabbed onto in this life that we're living right now. What you're going to be known by is whether you are a member of the family of God or not. This is the family that lives forever. It's the identifier for us that goes beyond uh, the life that you and I are living right now. We have all kinds of identifiers uh, that we call ourselves by, but there's not going to be any Americans in heaven or Europeans or anything else. You know what's going to be in heaven is members of the family of God. In Hebrews chapter 2, verse 11, it says, Jesus and the people he makes holy all belong to the same family. That is why he isn't ashamed to call them his brothers and his sisters. Now, I don't know if you can get your mind around that, but do you know Jesus calls you brother or sister? That's, that's amazing, isn't it? Because we've been adopted into the family. We are literally brothers and sisters, and we're identified in that way. Now, some people are identifying themselves by their sin. We were in Phoenix at uh, the same church for about 23 years. Uh, when I first became senior pastor, we had some issues that arose out of the church that, that caused us to start a 12-step program for Christians. And we were dealing with a, a lot of different kinds of, of things that were going on in people's lives. And, you know, the, the program originally had kind of a Christian start, but it's been co-opted and kind of taken on a secular nature, and so they, you know, will use terms like, you know, uh, higher power instead of God and those kinds of things. But really, those first three steps that are in the 12-step program are the salvation steps. Have you thought about it? 
It's really simply said, I can't, he can, I think I'll let him. (laughs) Those are the first three steps to giving your heart and your life to Jesus Christ. I can't stop what I'm doing. I can't be what I want to be. He can help me because He is all-powerful and He's able to. I believe I'm going to surrender myself to Him and let Him do it in my heart and life. But as we would go through those classes, one of the things I didn't like, and I really loved it when Rick Warren's uh, church came up with the Celebrate Recovery, and we adopted that into our format. But this was before that, and so we would identify ourselves. We'd get up there, you know, and say, hey, you know, somebody would introduce himself. Hi, I'm Frank, and I'm an alcoholic. You know, Uh, and so, you know, this was a a way of people identifying themselves and it was kind of identifying themselves with sin. But I loved it when when Celebration Recovery came along, because then it could be you could introduce yourself this way. Hello, my name is Frank. I'm a child of God who struggles with alcohol. Isn't that a better way to identify yourself? I'm a child of God who struggles with alcohol, or put in the blank there, whatever it is for your life. And you see the difference? The difference of people identifying themselves with the sin and identifying themselves with the hope of the Savior. Now, in the the end of days, as we said before, we're not going to be known as any of these identities. We're going to be known as children of God. Now, every family has a, a symbol you know, that they, they have adopted in Texas. There's some, you know, some large ranches like the King's Ranch, and they have their logos and their brands, you know, and you think when you see that, you think of that family. In other places, people have crests, uh, you know, that, that show back their heritage, and some of them linked with uh, maybe royalty down the line. I've heard people say to me, hey, you know, um, even in America, you know, my roots go all the way back to George Washington, or my roots go back to, you know, Abraham Lincoln. I've never heard uh, nobody's ever come up to me and said uh, my roots go all the way back to John Wilkes Booth or my roots go all the way back to Hitler. <laughs> I've never, never had anybody do that. Maybe you haven't either. <laughs> but uh, there, there are certainly symbols and, uh, you know, of, of being identified in family and, and different kinds of brand. Now, do you know what the symbol of being in God's family is? You know what the symbol of being in God's family is? Some say, well, is it the fish? Maybe, kind of. Uh, the symbol of being in God's family is baptism. Baptism. How many of you have been baptized? All right. Identifying yourself with Christ. Now, if you haven't, we want to talk to you because we, we spent some money and we bought a nice little portable baptistry. And in, in, in Easter, we baptized 12. It was fantastic. We could even heat that thing up, man. And we, can, we put it right out in the front. And we had a celebration. In fact, this uh, video you saw that was about the vision at Grace Place uh, was the voice on there. One of the voices was one of the guys giving his testimony just before he was baptized of what God had done in his life and how he had turned his life around. Isn't it fantastic? But the identifier is uh, for uh, being a Christian is baptism. That's our symbol. And, and we see people getting baptized. Oh, they're in the family. They're in the family. Yeah, look at that. That's a, that's a child of God. We, we all belong together. It's great to be a part of the family. Now, it says in Acts uh, 2 and 41, those who believed what Peter said were baptized and added to the church that day, about 3,000 in all. All right, let's move on to number two about the benefits of being in family and getting connected. Number two, in God's house, I am supported by others. In God's house, I am supported by others. It says in Scripture, don't you realize that all of you together are the temple of God, and that the Spirit of God lives in you. When I was in Phoenix, we went through a a major uh, renovation of this church. This church had been around for over 30 years, and it needed like some serious hardcore remodel. And these guys went to work for us, you know, a lot of volunteers in the church, and we kind of did construction from within. We didn't bring out uh, an outside crew. And we had a guy, we had a couple of construction guys there, and one of them oversaw it kind of as a, a master construction uh, project manager. And, and uh, so they were doing stuff. Man, there was a lot of electrical that needed to be done. It was old, it was outdated, needed to be rewired. We were we were doing sheetrock and painting and, you know, we totally redesigned the stage and did a number of different kinds of things. It's coming along beautifully. But I, I noticed something about construction when I was walking through the building 
that a number of times I would see pieces that looked like as if they had some value, like, you know, pieces of um, pipe for, uh, you know, electrical or uh, pieces of wood that, that looked, uh, you know, that they had some value to them or could be used. But I, I noticed that, that there were many things in this building in the, in the process of construction that were not connected to the building. You see where I'm going? Like, it was possible to be in the building, but not connected to to the building, not belong or be connected to the building. And I started thinking about how that can be uh, with us, even here at the Grace Place, that we can be in the building, but not be connected to the, bi- the vision, the thing that, that God wants us to accomplish. We are talking about this last night, and it didn't come out real well last night, so I want to try to say it again, but we're, we're talking about you need to make the next step. Not the next, the next step that you make may not be what your neighbor's next step is to belong and to become a part of what's, what God is doing here. For some of you, and I, I don't mean this in any bad way. It came out funny last night. We had some laughter. But for some of you, the next step is, is just getting to church regularly and on time. And that's, that's the next step. And I'm not making fun of that. That's just that's something that needs to happen. That's a part of saying, you know, I belong here, and this is where I should be. I want to say, you know, while we're here and we have a little family time, that if you do make it here at like 1030, you're 15 minutes late. Wait, I thought we started at 1030. We start, you know, immediately when family starts gathering on the property. And a lot of times we have visitors and people will come in at 1010 or 1015, because they're trying to, you know, they don't know where this place is, so they get here early. And we need to be here as family to greet them and to meet them. And, of course, we have to drop the kids off sometimes and do other things. We need to get some coffee and get a donut. we got to go hug somebody. we got to say an encouraging word. So for many, that might be the next step, is just getting here with an attitude and a heart to minister. I belong. I'm going to get connected I'm not just coming to an event. I belong to this place, and I'm a part of the ministry that takes place. Sometimes people will leave here, and the greatest ministry thing that happened to them was a two-minute interaction with a member of the body. Not the sermon, not the worship, not the special videos, but a two-minute interaction where somebody came and spoke into their life and encouraged them and lifted their spirits, and that was the ministry for their day that made their day and changed their life. For some of you, the next step would be getting involved in something like helping out with children's ministries or, or getting involved in, in some of the, the projects or things and events that are going on or taking, you know, helping us start a new avenue of ministry, care for the property and, and some of the, the reconstruction things that need to be done. You know, I'm not saying what you should be doing, but it is for many of you, that is your next step. All I'm saying is, whatever the next step is, that's what we need to be doing. Let's not be a part that has value that just lays in the building, as I saw all of those pieces when we were doing the major construction, but let's be connected to what God's doing in this place. Are you hearing me this morning? Amen? Together, we are the temple of God. And we need to be connected so we can be effective for His kingdom. We need each other. And as much as, as, as uh, you know, you and I need to the, the come together and worship God in the church, the church needs us. You know, people are encouraged by your life. They're encouraged by seeing you and, and, and each week and, and hearing from you and, and the hugs that they get from you. We had a little lady in our church, uh, Grammy Kay, we called her, and she passed out hugs, you know, and that was her thing, you know. And uh, she hugged on people and loved on people. Man, if she was ever missing, I, I got a question from every person in the building. Where's Grammy Kay? I didn't get my hug today. Where is Grammy Kay? What happened to her? Well, she was a little under the weather. She wasn't able to come today. Or she's out of town visiting her family or something. I had to explain to them. She had to call me in advance and tell me she was not going to be there because she was so loved and cared about and had such a great ministry in the church that people valued 
her and cared about those connections each week. Ephesians 2, 21 and 22, In Him the whole building is joined together and rises to become the holy temple of the Lord. And in Him you two are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by His Spirit. Romans 1 and 12, again, I mean that I want us to help each other with the, uh, the faith we have. Your faith will help me, and my faith will help you. We really underestimate the power of what we do together in terms of ministry. Your ministry here, just sitting by someone, encouraging someone, putting your hand on them and praying for them, it's, it's such value. Number three, the third benefit of belonging. In Christ's body, I discover my unique value. In Christ's body, I discover my unique value. Romans 12, verse 4 says, Just as there are many parts to our body, so it is with Christ's body. We are all parts of it. And it takes every one of us to make it complete. For we each have a different work to do, so we belong to each other, and each needs all of the others. We are different, and God loves variety, doesn't He? But we, when we come together, we are complete as a body, and God uses us in a great way. Now, if, if my eye, if I took one of my eyes out and I just set it over here, if I could do that, you know, it would, it would lose its value outside of the body. I would become monovision. <laughs> and, uh, you know, it is only by taking that eye and, and putting it back in here, into the body, that it becomes profitable. And that is, for all of us, we are profitable together as a body. It says in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 15, If the foot says, I am not a part of the body because I am not the hand, that does not make it any less a part of the body. And if the ear says, I am not a part of the body because I am not the eye, would that make it any less a part of the body? If the whole body were an eye, how would you hear? Or if the whole body were an ear, how would you smell anything? We are all important to the body. And together, we discover that we have unique value. We add to what's going on. And we need our insight, don't we, when we come together. Number four, in God's family, we are bonded together. We are bonded together. We don't today really understand a lot about shepherding and about sheep, and the Bible talks a lot about that. And the passage of Scripture that I want to read to you here, Psalms verse 100, says, uh, mentions it here. He made us, we are His, we are His people, the sheep of His pasture. Now we don't know a lot about sheep. We live in the city and you know, maybe some of you have been around uh, cattle a little bit, but for the most part, we don't really have an understanding of what that's about. Sheep need to be cared for by a shepherd. And God takes care of his sheep, and a beautiful picture of that is in, is in uh, Psalms 23. We're not going to read that, but you remember that gets read a lot at funerals for some reason. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. All of the beautiful things that are said there about how God takes care of the sheep and watches over them. But God has given us really uh, also two benefits inside family that, that help us. Now one is, is your, your pastor, your uh, eldership, your leadership, your spiritual leadership. And that, that word uh, pastor is, is, is the word uh, that is for shepherd. And here is a directive that God gives to his spiritual caretakers of his flock. And here's what he says in 1 Peter chapter 5. Care for the flock that God has entrusted to you. Watch over it willingly, not grudgingly, not for what you can get out of it, but because you are eager to serve God. Now these kinds of passages that talk about the role that, that, that we have as spiritual leaders, they make huge impacts on us. We know that we're going to be accountable for your souls. And it drives us on a day-by-day -day basis to, to educate, to encourage, to pray for you, to lift you up. And I'll tell you, this is, uh, I've often identified the calling that I have on my life with, 
with uh, what I see in the book of Jeremiah. And I shared this, this last night. Jeremiah was a prophet, and he didn't have uh, all of the good flowery prophecies to give out. There were some guys that got some good flowery stuff from God to tell to his people. Go tell the people that, you know, as um, the harvest is ripe, you know, they will go out and they will glean and, and they will be taken care of and, and their wants will be satisfied and so on and so forth. And stuff like that. You know what? Um, this is what would happen for Jeremiah. False prophets would stand up. The king would say, what do you guys have to say? We're going to go to war. And the false prophets would say, you're going to win. And as the horn of, of uh, the ram that I'm holding up, you're going to smite them and it's going to be mighty and, and you're going to conquer and, and get great riches and great things will happen to you. And all of them would have pretty much the same thing to say. And then the, the king, because he was suspicious and because he knew these guys were false prophets, would say, hey, Jeremiah, what, what do you think is going to happen? He says, you're going to get wiped out. God says you've turned your back on him, and he's going to destroy you and turn you over. You're going to be uh, sent off into bondage into other nations, and you're going to be dispersed, and he's going to destroy the walls of the city, and so on and so forth. This was the fun thing that Jeremiah got to do. And so because of that, he wasn't a popular guy. People didn't want to see him. They didn't want, you know, he, was, he was doing a kind of ministry that you know, it just it w didn't feel very good. And uh, he was the, the opposite of Joel Osteen, okay? He was the counter Joel Osteen. You know, if you turn on Joel Osteen to get encouraged and say, oh, you know, feeling better about myself, you'd turn on Jeremiah to feel horrible about yourself. <laughs> and to feel really rotten and ruined, okay? And uh, so this is kind of what I identify with about him, you know, was that sometimes ministry is hard. And Jeremiah got to the place where he said, I'm done with this, God. He's having a little one-on-one, him and God. He says, I'm tired of like not, you know, getting the good stuff to tell people, and I'm tired of people rejecting it, not wanting to hear it. You don't need me anymore anyway. There are other people out there, and so I'm finished. No, and, and, and it says, he said to God, no more will I speak the word of the Lord. I'm done. No more. Finished. Every spiritual leader, every pastor gets there. We always say you get, you get high on Sunday, you resign on Monday. You know, every, <laughs> every spiritual leader gets there, man, just like at the rock bottom, you know. And, and uh, you know, they just really get discouraged at times over things that happen. And so this is Jeremiah, done, no more. Get somebody else, I'm finished. But if you read a few verses down, something happens in here. And he says, his word was shut up in my bones like a fire. I was weary and forbearing, but I could not stay. What is he saying? I tried to say no to God. I wasn't going to do this. But there is a fire inside of me that God put there that makes no sense to the world why you would want to continue to do what you do. And I cannot not do this. <laughs> it's Spurgeon, hundreds of years later, saying to his ministerial students, MITs, ministers in training, saying to them, if you can do anything else in life, get out of here and go do it. If you can't, preach the gospel. <laughs> He's telling them, here's how you identify that it's real in you and it's burning in you. It's because you can do nothing else but this, this calling on your life. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 17 gives exhortation. Obey your spiritual leaders to all of us and do what they say. Their work is to watch over your souls and they are accountable to God. Give them reason to do it with joy and not with sorrow. That would certainly not be for your benefit. God has given us wonderful spiritual leadership. But the second thing God has given us is one another in family. Small groups are a way that plays out here at the Grace Place by connecting in small groups. Galatians 6 and 2 says, Share each other's burdens and in this way obey the law of Christ. I got a phone call uh, a couple of weeks ago from a lady who was passing through town and she didn't want to necessarily... Uh, she had, uh, had family and she had, was going up to San Antonio, so didn't want to bother us. It was all spur of the moment. 
but she was calling us, and a person who used to be in our church in Phoenix, and she just wanted to talk and hear my voice. And one of the things she reminded me about was the time that her and I spent together. She came into my office, had a very heavy burden, and she sat down and told me something that would just break your heart about her family. And she poured it out there. And it's one of those moments in ministry where I'm sitting there across from her. Her chair is here. My chair is here. And I'm sitting across from her. There's nothing between us. And I'm like, I have absolutely nothing to say. This is like the heaviest thing I have heard. I cannot, I don't even know what to do with this. And as she poured her heart out and she cried, I'm sitting here feeling more and more helpless. And I'm saying, God, please help me. I have no words to say. And then I opened my mouth and God spoke through it. And he said, he said through me to her, I don't know what the answer is from me to you for this situation or this problem. But I know what God is saying to me right now in this moment, and that is I am assuming a portion of your burden and you will leave here lighter than you came in. I'm taking some. That's what it means to be a part of the family of God. When you get out of that chair and you walk out that door, it's going to be lighter because I'm taking some of it. As much as God can put on me, I'm taking it and I won't let you leave here with this whole thing by yourself. We joined hands and prayed, and God's Holy Spirit entered that room. And it was really miraculous what happened over the next six months and how God really began to turn this situation around. It was beautiful. But many other members of that family, that church family, also came to her and took a portion of that burden on themselves. That's what it means to be family. The family we reach out to each other, we need each other, we are responsible for each other, and God is going to ask us at the end of days if we were a part of His family, if we shared one another's burdens, if we cared for one another. We don't do small group around here just because it's another ministry and other churches do it and it's important. We do it for that reason, what I'm talking about to assume one another's burdens, to take on the the role for one another. It's not just another thing so that your week can be busy. It's about helping you and encouraging you and being there for you as a spiritual. There's There's a spiritual apathy sometimes that falls over us. We get so busy with everything else, and we're running around, and we're busy people, and we can tell everybody about how busy we've been, but when there's a spiritual accountability for our lives, we recognize that there's very little we're doing in that area. And through small group, we can shore that up. We can encourage that. We can, we can encourage one another. We can get the Word of God fed into us. And I want to really encourage you to belong to small group. Number five, we're closing with this. God's family, my life becomes productive. In God's family, my life becomes productive. John chapter 15, verse 4, Remain in me, and I will remain in you. For a branch cannot produce fruit if it is severed from the vine, and you cannot be fruitful unless you remain in me. Yes, I am the vine, and you are the branches, those who remain in me. If you have this passage open, I want you to underline these words. Uh, And I in them, it says, these words, underline these, will produce much fruit, will produce much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. None of the fruit that God intends to bring through our lives can happen unless we're connected. Have any of you ever gone to your backyard? I have a peach tree in my backyard. I have never, ever, this hasn't happened. If it's happened to you, please tell me. It'd be wondrous. But I have never gone out there and, and picked a peach off of a branch that's hanging in space. There it is, just hanging in space. It's not connected to anything, and I'm, I'm gonna grab a peach. It's just, has, any, has that happened to any of you? You guys got a pear or a plum or a pomegranate off of a, a space-hanging limb. It's just out there. No, that, that limb is connected to the trunk, and the trunk is connected to the root. And that's how we bear fruit, because we're connected. A great deal of, of personal frustration inside of the church is a result of not understanding this scriptural truth. We all want to be productive in mission. And, and in the kind of mission that's going to live beyond this life. But we can fill our lives with, with a kind of busyness that's going to prevent us from staying connected. We're going to 
break the branch off and we're going to go over here and get involved in a lot of other things and not necessarily be connected and then we're going to wonder why there's no fruit this year to pull off. It's because we're not connected. We need it. The root source feeds us. The mighty trunk that grows up produces life and the limbs spread out and branch out and the fruit is on the branches but it's because we're connected to the whole system. Ask the worship team if they would come back. These are our reminders, the five benefits of being in family. I learn my identity. I am supported by others. I discover my unique value. I am bonded together for growth in Christ. My life becomes productive. The next step, what is it for you? I know what the next step is, what God's calling me to do. And uh, we, we talked about this, uh, you know, several months ago in our uh, leadership gathering, that God is really challenging us to move beyond the past, to look to the future, to see what He sees here and what He wants to do here. And sometimes it's hard because you know, you get clouded over by the things that have happened and sometimes you get caught up in the things that are in the present moment and you, you can't see beyond this. You can't see uh, what God wants to do with 12 acres of land right here that He's preserved and kept for this church. And God's calling us to look beyond, see that. For me and for our leadership, that's our next steps is to have the insight and the vision to see what God wants to see. But for some of you, there are s just some other steps, little steps right now that you need to make and to get connected to the overall vision in the building. You're like one of those uh, beautiful pieces that need to be connected to the building and they're laying around and I would walk in there thinking, I sp we spent a lot of money when I was walking through that church in Phoenix and, and we spent a lot of money on these supplies. I went down to Home Depot and bought them. These things better get connected. <laughs> you know, we better need these things, you know. I mean, I, I'm going to take these back, get my money back, you know. But they were needed, and little by little, they got connected. The plumbers came in and did their work. The electricians came in and did their work. The sheetrock guys came in and did their work. Little by little, those pieces began to disappear, and this building became beautiful. One of my friends walked through the building with me after it was completed, and he had been there before. And he said, Alan, you know, the beauty of this is you're going to have people walk through this door that are going to be joining the church, and they're never going to know what it looked like before. They're never going to have any idea. They're not going to be connected to your past and what happened and what it looked like and stuff like that. They're just going to know what it looks like now, and it's going to be beautiful. It's going to be gorgeous. They're going to think it's always been this way. God wants to connect you. What are the next steps? for you. Will you stand with me as we sing together?